sees the battle, you see my victory. And all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through. Let's thank the band for opening worship this morning. What a great start we have. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Pastor Tony, and I am delighted to see you in worship this morning on this 16th Sunday after Pentecost, a day of celebration, of course, because Arkansas Tech pulled out the win in overtime, and then a day of official mourning as well because of the Razorback loss. But let me tell you, people of God, the first half. I mean, come on, come on, good stuff, good stuff. <clears throat> well, we are delighted you're here this morning, and a welcome from the pastors and the staff. And those of you online, welcome. If you're a visitor, a guest, you're our guest this morning, and we welcome you and hope you'll take time to get to know us and find your place in ministry at Russellville First. 
For those of you online, I hope you'll go to russellvillefirst.org and you'll go over to the worship tab where you will see uh, the bulletin and announcements, everything that you need there. And for those of you here in person, I hope you grabbed a bulletin on your way in. And if you don't have one, I know there's an usher just outside that will help you out. Turn over to the back page. You'll see lots of news to use. We have a combined family Sabbath Combined service on September 29th, we will gather at 1040 for one service of worship that day. It'll be a great time. First Sunday is this evening at 5 o'clock. Come back, enjoy a meal. It's going to be a time of discipleship formation and multi-generational fun. So you just need to come and experience it. You'll be glad that you did. This week, Tuesday worship at 1130 Prime timers are always doing stuff. I also want to note that Mark Royce is retiring, and we're going to celebrate the years of work, dedicated work he has given here on Sunday, September 22nd from 940 to 1030. You can pop in and out there during the Sunday school hour. And we want to welcome Miller Giffen as our new custodian. Miller and his family are often in first service, and it is just an exciting time, and we Give thanks for all that Mark has done here in the life of the church. Men's breakfast, check this out, folks. It's for everyone this time. So I hope you'll mark your calendar for that. We can all come together and help to unload pumpkins and set up the pumpkin patch, which is a great way to fund our children's ministry under our family ministry umbrella. And you'll see inside of your bulletin an insert where you can volunteer and drop that in the plate this morning. Or we have a sign-up sheet in the back as well. So, lots of things happening in the life of the church. Women, if you haven't signed up for the retreat, please do that. You'll be glad you did. Family ministries, you see lots of things happening. We are a church that is on a mission, on a mission to make disciples who love God and love others, and I hope you can see that. This morning, we also have some friends with us this morning. I want to, the Reverend Patty Butler and Paul are here. They are homegrown folks, right? We are so proud of the ministry that you do at Sylvan Hills, Patty, and we are thankful, thankful for this church that nurtured her call into ministry. Let's continue our worship. Let's stand and sing.
so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. Phillips. I'm the director of children and family ministries here. I would love for the children to come up now. And while they're making their way up here, this is a great time for you to fill out that pew pad and let us know you're here and maybe meet somebody new uh, on your pew. Also, if you didn't hear that, there is a sign-up sheet on the table out there for volunteer for pumpkin patch. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all a little sleepy? Y'all look a little sleepy. Maybe a tiny bit. Um, well, let me ask you, are there things are there things that you love? Do you have things that you love? Yeah, maybe. What you got? Lego. Lego, yeah. I like it. Anybody else? Something you love? What you got? Maybe chunk. His dog, Chasing Chunk. Um, anybody else got something you love? Yeah, okay. Yes, your family. The rest of y'all are like, oh, yeah, I should have said that. <laughs> what, what, are, what were you going to say? Your family, yes. Um, well, and I love chocolate. I love lavender. I love my dog. Um, I love butterflies. You know, we have lists. We have things. Yeah, what else? There you go. That's true. My dog would have been upset if I didn't count her as family. 
So we, we have things we, we love. We have these things that we love. And in our scripture today, it's in 1 Corinthians, and that chapter is often called the love chapter. And it says some things like, it tells us what love is. It says, like, love is patient, and it's kind, and it, it doesn't, like, keep a list of wrongs. And, and I was thinking about, like, all these things that, that we love. I can't really be kind to chocolate or be, um, like, forgiving to lavender. So those things that we, um, that it says to do in that chapter are talking about with people, like in our relationships, right? But last week, if, if you were listening, and it was communion, so if you were here, you were in here, we were talking about love your enemies. And Jesus was saying, we're supposed to love even those people who aren't nice to us. So all of these things this week that we're looking at, being patient and being kind and not keeping a record of wrongs and, and on and on, we're supposed to do that not just like with our family and our friends and the, and the people we love, but with, with everyone. And, you know, sometimes in the Bible, I like it when it'll have like clear things. This is what you're supposed to do. We were talking about this in Sunday school. Um, and this chapter is really like that. So I think this one would be a really great one for some time this week to find some time with your family to read through it and see what it says. 1 Corinthians 13, and I bet some of it will sound familiar to you. And it's even in our Spark Bible if you want to read it from there. So giving you a little homework, you know, you're back at school now, a little homework to read that with your family and for y'all to talk about as a family what does it look like to love in those ways? And how can you do that? And maybe think about it in situations that you're in. How do you uh, do those things at school or at soccer or at football or in the grocery or wherever you are? And so I really hope that's something that you and your family can take some time to do. And maybe next week you can um, tell us about it and tell us what you have decided and, and what you have done, all right? So ho hopefully you can find some, some time to do that and something in there will um, take heart for you and take hold. Will you please pray with me? You can repeat after me. Let's pray. Please do. Dear Jesus, thank you for the example of your word. Help us to read it and help us to live it. Amen. Let's go to Children's Church.
Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part. We prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain these three, and the greatest of these is love. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning, I'm Pastor Lauren, and it's a joy to be with you all as we continue our series, Do Unto Others. Would you join me in an attitude of prayer? Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for these words from Paul that maybe we have heard again and again. Today we ask that they would be new that we would understand them in new ways so that our hearts might be open to what it means to love others. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus as an example for this. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few months ago, my friend Katie, who is pastor at the United Methodist Church in Batesville, texted some of my friends and she asked us in her text, what time is it? This was concerning. If you have a phone in your hand, you can normally tell what time it is, right? We told her it's 8.23 a.m., and then we asked, more importantly, are you okay? What's going on? She assured us that she was fine, and then she shared with us later why she had asked us what time it was. Katie had scheduled a dentist appointment in Batesville for 9 a.m., but the receptionist at the dental office had called her to tell her she was late for her 9 a.m. appointment. But she kept looking at her phone, and she could tell it said 8.23, or at least before 9 a.m., and so she was confused. Then the receptionist called again to tell her she was now 40 minutes late to her appointment, and is she sure she's going to be coming in today, or does she need to reschedule? Katie again insisted, it is not 9 a.m., and she has not missed her appointment. After they went back and forth a few more times in this conversation about what time it was and what time Katie's appointment was, they finally realized that Katie was talking to a dentist office in Batesville, Indiana, not in Arkansas. It was indeed before 9 a.m. in Arkansas, but an hour later in Indiana, which is the eastern time zone. Katie had scheduled her dentist appointment in the wrong place, the wrong state, and she would indeed not be making it to her dentist appointment. This story demonstrates the misunderstandings that happen so often in our conversations with others, right? 
Katie and the receptionist both knew they were right. They were sure about it. They even doubled down, insisting again and again that they knew what time it was in Batesville. How could the other person be so wrong? Katie went as far as to ask some other people to get input to make sure that what she had said was right. And we do this all the time, especially in conversations about things that are more important than what time our dentist appointment is. We, have this, we double down in the same way in conversations around political beliefs and religious values, those things that are most important to us. And for us as a friend group, this story is so funny because Katie's never going to run into this receptionist at the grocery store. This receptionist isn't going to come visit her church. But I think it's funny because it was low stakes. These two people are strangers. When we have a misunderstanding with our spouse or a friend or a family member, when we disagree on something, or even someone else in our church, it's a lot harder to laugh it off, isn't it? In fact, sometimes those misunderstandings may become something that divides us as individuals or families or even into groups in the church if we're not careful. And this is the scenario that Paul is dealing with as he writes this letter to the Corinthians that we read a part of today. Of course, the part we heard from Pastor Cindy is one of the most well-known passages in the epistles, and it's a beautiful part of Paul's letter. One of the reasons this passage is so well-known and beloved is because it's often included in weddings. Maybe this was the scripture read at your wedding or the wedding of a friend or family member. And while it is indeed a beautiful challenge and testament in regards to what love in, in marriage could look like or should look like, That is not the context in which Paul is writing this letter. In fact, I imagine if Paul knew that we were reading this scripture at weddings, that we had made this into a wedding liturgy, he would be pretty surprised. And even more than that, he would be surprised that people 2,000 years later are reading his letters to the church, to churches that he planted as sacred scripture. That is, in fact, what we're doing, right? We're reading someone else's mail. We're reading the mail that Paul wrote to specific communities who were having particular challenges in their infancy as a church. And so he wasn't writing to one or two people, but rather what he is describing about what love looks like and feels like and acts like. He's talking to the whole church, the plural you, the y'all. He wants them to all get it. He is reminding them that they are all meant to be one in Christ and that their differences should not lead to division, but rather should strengthen their work of inviting others to be followers of Christ with them. This is still a good word for us today, isn't it? While the 21st century church is not the church at Corinth, we sure do have some things in common. And we could use some advice from Paul on how to live into this election season in ways that demonstrate grace rather than disgust empathy rather than self-centeredness, and an attitude of listening rather than using our voices to drown others out. After all, the church at Corinth was diverse, just as our world and even our local church is today. And on the one hand, this was a subversive move by the church in the early days, a way of doing things differently than the Roman Empire expected. After all, in the Roman Empire, they wanted the rich to be rich and to look down on the poor and the poor to look up and know that they cannot survive without the rich. They wanted people to be divided, masters and slaves. Widows and orphans were not cared for. But in this church in Corinth, the rich and the poor, men and women, widows and children, slaves and their masters gathered together in community. Boundaries were broken and everybody was welcome at the table. And so, even though they were to celebrate this diversity, it led to disagreements and divisions. Throughout Paul's letter, the key theme he wants them to understand is that their diversity is not a hindrance to worshiping together, but rather something to celebrate. Welcoming everyone into the body of Christ was a non-negotiable for Paul. After all, he understood that God had called everybody together to be in relationship with one another, and it was time to find ways to get along, to find common ground and common goals. 
And so Paul doesn't waste much time writing before he lets the Corinthians know that he is disappointed in their inability to get along, and he seeks to correct their behavior. By the 10th verse of the first chapter, he says to them, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be knit together in the same mind and the same purpose. Paul then goes on to say he's been getting some tips from someone in the community about their disagreements. The Corinthians have been arguing about who the best teacher and leader is in their community. Some say Apollos and others Paul and some Peter. They're unable to agree upon who is leading them and who would be best to follow, forgetting that it is Christ's sacrifice on the cross that has given them the power to gather as a church. And it is through Christ's living and dying and resurrecting that this leadership has been appointed by Paul and Apollos and Peter, that what they bring to the community is because of Christ. Now, Paul does not take this moment to campaign for himself and tell them why he is the best teacher. Instead, Paul says to them, it's not about the specific people leading. Rather, it's about their ability to fulfill the role they've been given. Instead of seeing these leaders as rivals, Paul wants the church at Corinth to see them as co-workers, caring for community and caring for everybody's well-being. This is such a helpful reminder as we think about our own tendency to be divided. What are the questions we should be asking ourselves and one another about who we follow? When should we take a step back and ask ourselves and others, hmm, maybe we don't have it all figured out. What do we need to learn? What do we need more information about? Maybe we might even say, wow, I can see the ways God is working even among people I vehemently disagree with. What is God up to if we pay attention to how God has called us to work together rather than be divided? There are many other disagreements and divisions that Paul is trying to offer counsel on as well, but the one that leads him to write 1 Corinthians 13, this poetic chapter on love, is a final argument about whose spiritual gifts are better. Apparently, some of the people in the community have decided their gifts of speaking in tongues or of preaching or even their faith are more important than other people's gifts. Paul is so frustrated by this misunderstanding of spiritual gifts that he says to them in the end of chapter 12, strive for the greatest gifts and I will show you a more excellent way. Of course, that more excellent way is love a gift that the Holy Spirit has given to each one of us. We all have different spiritual gifts that are unique to us, but love is something we are all bound together by. And Paul explains this so beautifully as he reminds the Corinthians that if they speak in tongues or have the gift of prophecy or have unshakable faith, none of that matters if they don't have love. Those spiritual gifts, they're just noise. They're just distractions. They're just dividing you if they are not imbued with love and if your focus is not on how to love one another and bring others to love Christ and know Christ. He goes on to offer the part that we know best that begins, love is patient, love is kind. And these verses offer us a portrait of Christ. Just before he left his disciples for the cross in his farewell discourse in John, Jesus says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. We don't know what Jesus looked like physically, but we have a picture of him spiritually. He was love incarnate, and the characteristics of love in these verses help to remind us of the way of Christ, the way of love. We also know that Christ was love in action, when we think about kindness and patience and the welcoming nature of Christ, it was because of what he did. When we hear love is patient, love is kind, it sounds kind of passive, right? But that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is describing a love that takes action rather than a passive feeling toward one another or towards lavender or butterflies, right? Love waits patiently. 
Love acts kindly. As we define love, as Paul does, we discover that love is an infinite resource. It's abundant, unlike money or time or other things we take for granted. Instead, love does not run out. This is what Paul says in the final verses. While prophecies and knowledge are limited, love never ends. So how do we grow in love? How do we practice love like we practice a sport or a musical instrument? We practice in community. We do it together. We find people like Paul who will hold us accountable when we get distracted by division or disagreement. And we pay attention to when we might not have the whole story, when we might not have it all figured out, whether it's what time it is in Batesville or whose spiritual gift is better or what political party we truly believe is gonna lead us to our preferred future. We let those things go for the sake of love. I'm sure many of you know about the famous friendship between two of our Supreme Court justices in our modern era that of Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia. Much was made about their friendship because they were two justices who were diametrically opposed when it came to the significant decisions of the Supreme Court. They served together for 40 years, first in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Court Circuit, and eventually they joined the ranks of the Supreme Court, Scalia in 1986 and Ginsburg in 1993. While they seemed unlikely friends, the two bonded over their similarities, both in the courtroom and in their personal lives. When it came to work, they had a mutual devotion for the Constitution, while built on different interpretations that helped them to have a mutual respect for one another. After, and their shared love of opera led to their friendship outside of serving as justices. That friendship extended to eating meals in each other's homes, celebrating the holidays together with their families, and of course, attending the opera and other arts events together. Despite their differences, or even because of them, this pair maintained a close friendship that lasted most of their lives. At one point, when asked why he and Ginsburg got along so well, Scalia responded, what's not to like? except her views of the law, of course. They respected each other, and they understood that though they had different approaches, they were both dedicated to the same goals, and common interest, and common passion. And they were both dedicated to the Constitution, the court, and our country. Of course, their friendship was undergirded by love, Not a flimsy, wishy-washy love, but a love that admired difference and found ways to work and live together in community alongside other Supreme Court justices with different views and opinions, too. This is one portrait of what love looks like lived out in the world. So how do we set an example of what love looks like in action during this election season? How do we do that as a faith community? One place to start is with Paul's words. We remember that these words are not just meant for people in a covenant relationship of marriage, but rather Paul's words are for friendships, for community, for a church that strives to follow Christ above all else. And when we read Paul's words as we do a temperature check to see how we're doing, I wonder what would happen if we inserted the word we into his ode to love in place of the word love. How are we doing even aspirationally for now. Hear this letter this way. We are patient. We are kind. We are not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. We do not insist on our own way. We are not irritable. We keep no record of wrongs. We do not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoice in the truth. How are we doing, church? What work do we have to do? I know I still have work to do, but with God's help and the encouragement and accountability of one another, we can turn love into action. We can celebrate our diversity. We can be drawn together, bound together, rather than separated. And we can do this with the confidence of God because even when we're unsure of what the future holds in these next few months, what we do know is that love never ends. 
Love never fails. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand as we respond to God's word with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we go into our time of prayer this morning, I want to call your attention to the prayer list printed in your bulletin. Today we want to be sure to remember Donna, Stanley, Mary Ann, Rosemary, Charlotte, Tyler, Will, James, and extend condolences to the family of Greg Moore. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, God of love, we give thanks for love incarnate in Jesus Christ, for he has shown the center of love and self-giving, and the power of the Holy Spirit gives us that love and the ability to love others in the same way. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of times that we have been the noisy gong or the clanging cymbal. Help us, Lord, to be your people, people of faith, people of hope, people of love. And Lord, we pray for those all around us. We pray and give thanks for the body of Christ, for the members of this body of Christ, and for the work that you have given us and the mission to make disciples who love God and love others. And my friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers as dear to us as our own needs. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we offer our thanksgivings and petitions on behalf of the church in the world. Ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Laura, for our Superintendent Roy Beth, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Hear our prayers, God of power, and through the ministry of your Son, free us from the grip of the tomb, that we may desire you as the fullness of life and proclaim your saving deeds to all the world. Hear us now as we pray the prayer you have taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
My brothers and sisters, we've heard from God's word today. We have confessed our sins and we have been forgiven. There's nothing that stands in the way of the the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. So I say to you, peace be with you. Let's stand and exchange signs of God's peace. As you make your way back to your seats this morning, I'll call your attention to our offering slide, the pumpkin patch. We are so grateful for your financial gifts that help to make ministries like the pumpkin patch possible. It's a wonderful tool for outreach in the life of our community. It's always a joy seeing the preschools and the kindergartens come and visit and enjoy the pumpkin patch. So we are thankful for the way you give in support of things like this. I'll remind you of the ways to give. You'll see them on our slides now. You can text to give. You can drop a gift in the plate. You can go to russellvillefirst.org and click give or call the church. And these are in your bulletin as well. Let's pray for our tithes and offerings. Loving creator, We dedicate these offerings with our hearts guided by your wisdom and grace. As we gather on this September Sunday, may our gifts embody the teachings of your word. Help us to be kind. Help us to be merciful. Help us to love all. Use these offerings to uplift, if uplift those in need, fostering hope and peace in our community. May we live out your wisdom in our actions and generosity. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All of creation, all of the earth, Make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. is coming soon.
joy to be here and worship with you. If you have questions about what it means to be a disciple of Christ or on a discipleship journey, your pastors would love to meet with you throughout the week to hear your story and walk alongside you. If you are experiencing grief or loss of some kind, we have congregational care ministers who have been trained to walk alongside you in that. They'll pray with you and meet with you as you need them. And um, if you haven't taken the next step in our membership covenant, we'd love for you to consider doing that as well. You have a church of people that will hold you accountable in that. We did have two new people join us this morning at 8.30, and so we're grateful for that. Let us continue in worship. I invite you to stand.
Cause I can see a light that is coming for a heart that holds on And there will be an end to these troubles But until that day comes Still I will praise you Still I will praise you Yes, I can see a light that is coming For a heart that holds on And there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes Still I will praise you Still I will praise you Singing, oh no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh no, you never let go In every high and every low songs that we sang this morning, Reckless Love, reminds us that God's love stops at nothing. God will come after us, will climb up a mountain, break down walls, break down boundaries and barriers to be with us. And that is the same kind of love that we are called to live out. So might you have a reckless love modeled after God and the way that Christ leads us as you go forth this week to break down boundaries and barriers, knowing that there is no division in us who are in Christ. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. I don't know what it is you're loving these days. Maybe it's the cooler temperature that nip in the air this morning. Maybe it's all things pumpkin spice. Maybe it's a certain candidate or a certain news outlet. But whatever it is, let us be sure that it is the love of Christ overarching and going through it all so that we might turn around and show that love to the world. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Bind us together, 